he adas. It's a Greek word, and it's a word that we translate in English for way, road, street, or journey. And this word came to be, as you may know, the earliest follow- what the earliest followers of Jesus were called. Before we were called Christians, we were called followers of the way. In Acts 9, verse 1 and 2, we hear the first mention of this term to refer to those who followed Jesus. Quote, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. We don't really think about this term very much, except for maybe when we run across that interesting fact that before we were Christians, we were called followers of the way. And in our gospel reading today, the word itself, heados, way, is in verse 27. And it's not really a significant word in and of itself of our gospel text. It's just part of the narrative, right? And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples. Now, the way, as I mentioned, it can be something that refers simply to the road or the street, and here that's one such case. But the naming of the followers of Jesus in the early church as followers of the way is no accident. It doesn't stem from this verse. Instead, it stems from John 14, 6, one of Jesus' great I am statements where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In all of those places, the same Greek word is used, he adas, way. Yet in our gospel reading, despite its lack of importance, at least just the term itself, In the discourse that follows Jesus with his disciples in Mark 8, hits on the core of all three meanings of the word heados, of the way, and why it came to be the name for all those who follow him. So Mark 8, 27 to 38, marks a huge shift in the book of Mark. In fact, in our own Concordia commentary series, our Greek scholar who wrote the commentary for the book of Mark This is where he starts his second volume. So significant is the shift that happens here. Um, It's the place where the specific ministry of Jesus begins to manifest itself in the way that no one, including the disciples, could predict or could ever imagine. The hidden truth of Jesus is beginning to be revealed. You see, Jesus pressed his disciples regarding who he actually is. And he begins by asking them the question, Who do other people say that I am? And they give us a snapshot into what most people thought of Jesus at this point. That he is John the Baptist, or Elijah reincarnated, or one of the prophets. Right? That's pretty high praise, one of the prophets. But it turns out it's Not high enough. None of those identities are true. And so then he presses the disciples again, but asks the question of them. Not who does everybody else say that I am, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, who in Mark really serves as a spokesperson for all the disciples, says, you are the Christ. Now the term Christ has so much meaning built into it related to the Messiah and the salvation of God's people, more even, as we're going to find out, than Peter himself knew. But this is the first time in the entire book of Mark, chapter 8, where Jesus is correctly identified as the Christ. So the mystery of God is beginning to be revealed in Jesus right here in Mark chapter 8. But now Jesus begins to really, I think, hit on why we are called the followers of the way. Because from this point on, we take a different road. A road which is difficult to understand. A road which we're tempted at all times to reject, as we're going to see in the example of Peter. 
because we usually come, even when we come to faith in Christ, we come with our own ideas of what that means. And we wrestle with this constantly, and so Jesus must teach us what it really means that he is the Christ. And so the very next verse is it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise. And just so that we can't make the sort of argument that, well, Jesus said this probably in a very vague way and the disciples didn't really get it, The next phrase says, and he said this plainly. So we went from Jesus not really being identified correctly by anyone. Peter confesses his real identity as Christ, but little does he know what Christ is actually here to do. And then Jesus tells his disciples, and shocking would be an understatement. It's so shocking that Jesus is taken aside by his own disciple, Peter, and rebuked for what he says. So if we were to put this in our own words, it would be Peter takes Jesus aside and says, no, 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 Jesus, that's not the way this works. That's not what the Christ has come to do. Let me tell you. Which, of course, makes us chuckle a bit until we realize that we often do something very similar. When Jesus tells us and teaches us things we don't understand or don't want to hear. But this is really where the true nature of the way, the way of Christ, begins to reveal itself in the book of Mark. It marks a major turning point for the disciples because at this point is where they begin to, if they want to stick with Jesus, they begin to leave behind everything of this world. And this is sort of summed up in the phrase, after Peter rebukes him, Jesus, in turn, rebukes Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. And why is Peter so hung up? Why is he so worried? Because he's not setting his mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, Peter had an idea about what the word Christ meant. So, in a way, we could maybe say that he didn't even really know what he was saying when he said, You are the Christ. Because when Jesus informed him of what the Christ was here to do, He didn't like what he heard. This is the true way of Jesus. This is why it's such a big turning point in the book of Mark. And it's a big turning point for us as well. You see, the word, the way, also refers to a journey. It could be your literal journey or a journey of faith in which you're following Jesus. And in this case, it's both for the disciples. And if they follow Jesus on this way, what they know is going to be left behind. Now, it's what they know both in what is meant to be suffered by the Christ and those who follow him, but we don't despair because it also leads to even greater triumph and joy and life than the disciples can currently conceive of. From this point on in Mark, the way of Jesus completely and utterly diverges from any conceived way of man. Peter's response to Jesus' teaching and Jesus' response to to Peter's rebuke demonstrates this divergence. So what exactly is the nature of the way of Jesus, and why is it such a turning point for us, just as it is for the disciples? Well, Jesus further explains what it means to follow him, to go this way. This is verse 34 to 38. I'm going to summarize a few points. Those who will come after him on this way, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after him. Now, as I shared with the children at this point, nobody knows anything about the crucifixion of Jesus except for Jesus alone. He's only shared with them that he has to die and that he'll rise again. And so here, when we hear the word cross, I think we often think of the cross, but Jesus is talking about that, but also something else. That whatever burden that is placed upon us for following in his way is what he's referring to here by the word the cross. In other words, he's being upfront with you, that if you follow me, there's burdens to bear in this world, because the world, just like you didn't, doesn't understand 
and instead rejects my way. Those who follow this way must be willing to lose their life for the sake of Christ and the gospel. As I was preparing for this sermon, I was just thinking about last week when we welcomed new members into our midst here at Ascension. And one of the questions I asked them is, are they willing to hold to this confession of faith even to the point of death? To which they answered, I do by the grace of God. Those who follow this way must not be ashamed of Jesus, specifically as he's revealing himself now as the suffering servant spoken of in Isaiah, who must suffer in our place, who isn't going to deliver us the glorious, triumphant victory that Peter thought of and that many others thought of and that we often hope for. In one book I've read, this is sort of the categorization of the entire ministry of Jesus is everyone, including the devil, is asking Jesus to make things right with power as we understand it. And yet he insists on doing what we refer to as the alien work of God. And we call it that because we don't understand it. It's nothing we would have ever come up with, which is why God sent Jesus to tell us what he's up to. Right? He always makes the first move. Even in the Old Testament today when he makes the covenant with Abraham, who's making the covenant with who? It's God, the God of the universe, making the covenant with Abraham. God always makes the first move, and he does here again. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul or his life? Believe that the Christ came to destroy an enemy beyond our imagining. It isn't just a negative thing that we don't know about. It's not that we just don't know about the burdens of following Jesus. We don't even know the state of play. Peter thinks Jesus is here to throw off the yoke of the Romans. But he's come to face an enemy far greater. An enemy that we cannot hope to defeat. And so he goes his way to Jerusalem and calls us to follow. He is the one who bears a sacrifice beyond our imagining. Whatever burden that we bear in following him, he has borne and more precisely so that they are no longer burdens to us. And he's going to establish a kingdom beyond anything we can think of. This is the way of Jesus. This way is the journey of Lent that we are on. During Lent, we leave the ways of the world and the ways of men behind. I think it's one of the reasons that as a season of the church here, it has the most fascination by those outside of the church and the most consternation about those within, because we leave the ways of the world behind. One of the goals of Lent is to curb the ways of the world in us, not just for the sake of disciplining ourselves, but so that we may follow Jesus as he goes to Jerusalem and to the cross and to the grave and to the empty tomb. We follow in the way, the way of Jesus. This is a way of faith where our Lord leads us. He has to. We don't even see the way. He has to reveal it to us. And he does this graciously and continuously. Because it's not like after this teaching and the rebuke of Jesus here in Mark chapter 8, Peter's good to go. We know how the story goes as they continue to follow Jesus. And as it gets closer and closer to the climax of this alien work of God on the cross... His disciples fall away. His disciples deny him and betray him. Yet here in Mark 8, Jesus begins to teach his disciples that God has chosen this way for his suffering servant, that the Christ has come to take our place under the judgment of God. It's a path that he sees clearly and brings us onto because we don't even know it's there. And it's a way that he will complete, as we know when we celebrate with joy the victory on Easter. So, dear friends in Christ, as we follow him on the way, let our gospel reading in Mark lead you to reflect on this turning point for yourself. 
Just like the twelve, you're a disciple of Jesus. And just like the twelve, you may have begun to follow Jesus with your own ways in mind, or maybe you still do. You're in good company. Today we were reminded of the truth of the scriptures that at the right time, Jesus was sent to die for us. And do you know what that right time was? While you were still a sinner. He knows that when we come to faith in him, we still struggle with keeping our mind on the things of God. Constantly being pulled back to the things of this world. Not understanding some of the things he tells us to do or calls us to. Not understanding or having trouble doing maybe uh, one of the difficult things of the Christian life. Rejoicing and suffering, as Paul says in our epistle reading today. None of these things come naturally to us or make sense to us because they're not our way, but they are his way. And in our baptism, when he made us his own, he called us on his way. So take some time this week to read these verses again and reflect on them. In our Bible class right now, we're doing discipleship training. And we're training by relying not on ourselves, but on the gifts of God that have come to us. His teaching, just like the disciples have received here in his word, and the gifts of his sacrament, the fruits of his cross, the promises of the covenant he makes with us in our baptism, just as he did with Abraham all those years ago. So even if you're not in the class, I invite you to join in this exercise with us. Reflect on the verses, meditate on them, open yourself up to receive them. For this is where the way of Jesus comes from. It isn't within us, but it is within him, and he gives it to us through his word and his sacrament. So ask yourself as you read these verses, what things have I insisted upon doing my way, even when Jesus is teaching me and calling me to a different way? What are the things that I'm being called to bear for the sake of Christ today? Following the way is the way of losing my life in order to save it. This is the way of denial of self and the endurance of whatever must be endured for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Pray that the Lord helps you to receive those things and to do those things. You see, in Christ we learn that this is the way of joy, salvation, and life. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but it is, because this way does not end on Good Friday and on the cross. It ends with a victorious resurrection from death, the forgiveness of sins, and a new imperishable life. These are the things of God that Jesus speaks to us of today. These are the things where when you became a Christian, by the grace of God, you left the world behind. No longer a person of the ways of this world, but of his way. The way of Jesus. These are the things of victory. These are the things of life. These are the things of God. And in Jesus, they are all given to you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, for we do not always see what is in front of us. We don't always understand what it is that you have called us to do, and we're always tempted to rely on ourselves and to see things as we see them in the world. Help us to deny ourselves and to follow you to open ourselves by the grace of your Holy Spirit to receive your teaching and your word so that we may know the truth. The truth of our suffering, that we can rejoice in the midst of it because you share our suffering on the cross. And the truth of victory and life, not over some earthly power, but over the cosmic powers of this present darkness. And that you have, by your grace, given us perfect eternal gifts life, forgiveness, and salvation. 
all for the sake of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray.